All right, welcome to Counterculture Labs for our talk on the Kombucha Genomics Project. So we are using kombucha, which is a fermented black tea, typically, uh, as session as an excuse to do uh, lots of great science. So we're uh, examining these kombucha cultures from a wide range of different perspectives, including the genomics and sort of sequencing side. Uh, but we've also done sort of more material science kind of projects um, where we uh, actually can make a vegan letter out of the kombucha. And if my slides wants to advance, that would be nice. There we go. <laughs> um, we've taught essentially microbiology 101 classes where we make isolates from kombucha cultures. We've brewed a lot of kombucha. Uh, we've looked at the various health benefits of kombucha. Uh, one of the members in our project right now is doing an art project using kombucha. Uh, so it's all good. Uh, actually, one of the very first projects we did, our, this was one of our first meetings, we did just a taste testing. We got a bunch of different uh, kombucha bottles. And then just on the fly, we figured out sort of, okay, what kind of uh, metrics do we want to rate these different kombuchas on? So we came up with a bunch of different descriptors, sweet, sour, bitter, fruity, flowery, et cetera. Um, and then since we have lab, we also actually measured the pH. We measured uh, amount of titratable acids and a couple of other things. There's some information we were able to get from the back of the uh, of the bottle, um, and um, yeah, just did the, you know, everybody uh, got to rate each of these kombuchas on a number of different characteristics, and then the goal was to see if we could correlate those different flavor notes with what organisms are actually in the kombucha. Um, so, a couple of interesting things that came out of this data that we collected is that uh, how sour kombucha tastes uh, is pretty much uncorrelated with the pH. Uh, it is uh, far better correlated with uh, the amount of titratable acids, and that has to do with how your mouth detects acidity, essentially. So if you know how that works and how to measure that, ask me and I can explain. Um, we also uh, submitted the same uh, bottles that we, we taste tested for microbiome sequencing. So one of the benefits of going with commercial bottles is that you, know, you can do another uh, experiment on the same kombuchas you know, a month later and not have to worry that your, your sample is gonna be radically different from what it was in the first experiment you did. Um, so uh, we did some uh, microbiome analysis in a DNA barcoding workshop that we did. And uh, we actually tossed in some other fermented products here. So you see some cheeses and uh, yogurt in the, in the foreground. Uh, so we had a bunch of people bring in their own kombuchas. And then we, we tossed in a couple of bottles as well. Uh, and we actually used uh, a service called Ubiome which was actually a uh, human microbiome sequencing company. So they would sequence your gut microbiome, for example, and tell you what bacteria are in there. Um, but we had discovered that um, they were doing a five for one deal on their sampling kits, like twice a year or so. So we were waiting and until they did their five for one deals and we would buy these sampling kits and by doing it that way, we got the price per sample down to $18 per sample uh, to get a fairly in-depth sort of next-gen sequencing uh, breakdown of all the different species that, uh, that are in the sample. Yeah, and somebody po posted uh, some of the things that the Ubiome folks uh, ran into. Yes, yes, Ubiome is unfortunately no longer around. They got shut down because they were... Uh, getting into all sorts of shenanigans, double charging the health insurance for their services. But they were the perfect solution for doing kombucha sequencing, uh, <laughs> where it doesn't matter too much. You know, 
we got towards the end of their uh, their uh, uh, their life you biome uh, we definitely got several uh, samples that were clearly mixed up we got some samples back that looked like gut microbiome rather than kombucha, which means that somebody else who submitted their gut microbiome probably got a kombucha result back. And yeah, uh, they were having problems, let's put it that way. We still have not found a affordable replacement for this kind of sequencing, though. So if you know anything about uh, uh, amplicon sequencing for a very cheap price, we would love to know about it. Uh, but this allowed us to, for example, look at, uh, you know, what species are actually present in these various kombuchas. And you sort of see three different extremes here. The one on the left uh, has all these Komagate bacteria species of bacteria, which is, are the ones that you expect to find in kombucha. The one in the middle here has a whole bunch of lactobacillus. Now, uh, lactobacillus is a probiotic bacteria that typically does not really occur in natural kombucha. And so what the commercial kombucha makers do is they actually add lactobacillus. Um, first of all, so they can claim that their kombucha is probiotic because the normal kombucha cultures does not is not considered a probiotic because the, the species don't actually survive in your gut. But if they add a probiotic, they can say it's probiotic, right? Uh, secondly, lactobacillus um, is known in the beer and wine industry as a spoilage organism because it will stop the fermentation dead. And um, that means that if you add lactobacillus to kombucha, first of all, you won't be generating an excessive amount of alcohol, in which case your kombucha may need to be taxed as an alcoholic beverage, uh, but it also stops the, the bottles from exploding on the shelves due to excessive fermentation. Uh, and you can tell they, they don't particularly care how much lactobacillus they add. They probably just add a scoop of powder and they, they don't really care that almost half of their kombucha is, winds up being lactobacillus. Uh, this one is even worse. There's like a tiny sliver of original kombucha culture in there, uh, but most of it was actually lactobacillus species. Um, so this looks much more like, you know, a dairy product than an actual kombucha. It's entirely possible that by adding lactobacillus, they're making a healthier product because it is a, a probiotic, by the way. Um, but it is less like a kombucha, right? <laughs> so some interesting sequencing results that were uh, coming out of that. So what else can we do with kombucha? Well, um, we could try and grow it on different sugars for one. Let's see. I'm having a hard time advancing my slides here. There we go. So normally kombucha is made with table sugar, so sucrose, right? So we did an experiment where you can grow the same culture on sucrose, dextrose, which is glucose, uh, mannitol, maltose, and lactose. And then again, you can look at the bacterial composition in there and you see that there's sort of two dominant Comagate bacter species in the, on the sucrose culture. In mannitol, one of them completely dominates, the other one is is almost indetectable and in lactose the other one actually dominates so so some interesting differences we've done a couple of other experiments along those lines sort of figuring out um, how different uh, growth conditions affect the, the culture um, so here's another one we did uh, comparing June with kombucha sorry this slide got a bit messed up so June is a type of kombucha that's made with green tea and honey rather than black tea and, sh and table sugar. And it turns out that uh, June tends to ferment quite a bit faster. Uh, so it's typically done in under a week, whereas for, you know, regular kombucha is sort of 10 to 14 days. Um, and it also has, some people say it has a more refined taste. Uh, some people call it the champagne of kombucha. 
Uh, so we're wondering, okay, does it grow faster because it's a different culture? Or does it grow faster because it's grown on green tea rather than black tea? Or does it grow faster because it's grown on honey rather than table sugar? So we did all four combinations, essentially. So you see we have a black tea culture. We have a June culture here. Um, these are the black tea with uh, uh, table sugar versus honey. This is the green tea with uh, table sugar versus honey. Uh, and then we made all eight possible combinations, essentially, right? And then just followed up how those grow. And interestingly, we thought there was going to be one factor that really determines things. I thought it was going to be the honey, uh, and it's not, right? So the, we checked the growth rate. We checked how much cellulose is being produced. Uh, we checked how fast the pH changes. And there's a, a complex interplay between the culture and which tea you are using and which uh, sugar source you're using. So, somewhat unexpected from, from my perspective. There we go. We also made vegan leather, as I mentioned in the beginning. Um, so if you grow kombucha, you saw on, on the very first slide, uh, there's this white layer that forms on top, right? Uh, and that white layer is actually uh, bacterial cellulose. It's almost pure cellulose. Uh, so you can grow kombucha in these white trays and actually try and maximize how much surface area you have and then collect the, uh, the the cellulose layer that grows on top. So the layer that grows on top, it's typically called a SCOBY, which stands for Symbiotic Co-Culture of Bacteria and Yeast. Um, that term really refers to the culture, but people use it to refer to the, the cellulose pellicle, I guess is the, the formal scientific E term. Um, so when, when pe you hear people talking about uh, SCOBY, they're typically talking about that sort of solid layer that floats on top of the, the kombucha. Uh, so if you harvest that layer early, you get something that looks very gelatinous, kind of like that. Um, and there's actually, uh, I know there was at least one startup that actually tried to use this material as uh, sort of uh, uh, an artificial skin for burn patients. So you can harvest this, uh, get rid of all the cells that are in there. The, you know, you can completely sterilize it and then use it uh, for burn patients because it really holds, holds moisture very well. Uh, and then if you dry this out, it will shrink in thickness, but not in width. So if you do it in a bin like there, you'll get a sheet that's the same size of that bin, uh, but it shrinks enormously. So this is the kind of material you get out of a thin layer like that. It's like, it's like tissue paper, essentially. It is stronger than tissue paper, um, but this is not really usable as a leather material, right? So for that, you need to collect a much thicker SCOBY. So you can see this one here that I'm pulling out of the bin is, uh, well over half an inch thick. It's probably closer to like three quarters of an inch. And we have a nice rectangular sheet, fairly uniform. Uh, and if you dry that out, you get something that looks a lot and feels a lot more like leather. Here's a big piece that we uh, wind up cutting into strips to then uh, test various surface treatments. So we, we did uh, various experiments on this material uh, to figure out how to best waterproof it, how to keep it sort of as flexible as leather, and all of that. So um, somebody was asking, is it is it uh, comparable to the mycelium leather? There is actually a startup that came out of IndieBio on the East Coast uh, uh, this, this year that uh, is making uh, kombucha leather. And they, they come up with some kind of proprietary treatment uh, to essentially waterproof it and keep it flexible. Um, 
so yeah, it, it is a very nice material. Uh, the the main drawbacks are that um, it is very water absorbent, so it's not going to go back to to this state. But if you put some drops on here, you'll see it'll become a little whitish and it'll start swelling a bit. Um, and uh, so you can rub various oils or waxes on top to uh, to waterproof it. And we've done some of those experiments uh, at Counterculture Labs as well. Um, and then some some of our members actually made uh, uh, an entire key pool sized uh, SCOBY in somebody's backyard. So we have like a three foot diameter uh giant piece of uh kombucha leather essentially so that's a fun experiment that we would love to do more on that we're probably going to diy some of sort of the the equipment that you would need to for uh material science like being able to do a pull test to see how strong this material is uh doing some microscopy on the material and stuff like that. So there's definitely more to come on this topic that, that we want to pursue. And then, uh, so at the last uh, Maker Fair, I guess it was 2019, we actually had a kombucha petting zoo uh, because this material is actually, it's, it's really interesting to feel. You know, you have this sort of material that almost feels like raw skin. Or, uh, or somewhat gelatinous. So we had a, a petting zoo out. We had these bins with uh, kombucha sheets at uh, Maker Fair, and then also some of the dried material uh, for a comparison. So you see our uh, our flat rectangular bins there uh, with the uh, the kombucha growing for uh, in preparation for Maker Fair. Uh, over on the right here, you also see our kombucha library that we have at Counterculture Labs. Uh, so it's just a little standalone uh, little wall cabinet that I bought at IKEA. Um, and this uh, sort of black and white striped material at the bottom there is actually a heating mat. And we have a thermostat sitting on the side here with the, the thermometer for the thermostat is on the inside, actually. So it's a nice sort of a, a compact uh, growth environment with a, a fairly stable temperature uh, that we can grow all of our cultures in. And we've been collecting uh, cultures from all sorts of sources, people that are growing their own kombucha. Uh, there's also several online sources that will sell you a live SCOBY and you can just get like a, a wet SCOBY double packed in some uh, plastic bag uh, over the mail. So uh, before uh, the pandemic, we had built up a library of about, I'm just going to say a little over a dozen, maybe 14, 15 different uh, kombucha cultures. Uh, and then of course, during the pandemic, you know, we just had everything sitting there. We didn't feed them. We didn't do anything. Uh, after more than a year not being maintained, uh, most of them dried out or got moldy. Uh, we still have four or five of those that we had originally collected uh, that are still alive. Uh, but we're looking forward to uh, rebuilding that library now that we're uh, back operational. Um, we would also love to do a, uh, a crowdsourced project where we collect uh, kombucha cultures from all around the country or, or all around the world for that matter. Uh, and then uh, sequence the bacterial composition of these cultures. Um, because I think there's enough similarities from batch to batch in the microbial uh, composition that we may be able to tell who donated the culture to somebody else just based on the similarity in their, their cultures. So it'd be fun to trace sort of this entire network of people donating kombucha scobies to each other and to their friends and to their family uh, across the world. It'd be fun to retrace that based on the, uh, the sequencing data. Um, health benefits. Uh, so I mentioned um, 
kombucha is not really considered a probiotic, right? So the, the, the natural kombucha cultures don't actually survive in your gut. It's considered a prebiotic, meaning that some of the um, uh, biochemicals that are produced during fermentation uh, are providing health benefits. And one of the big ones that is often mentioned is glucuronic acid. So glucuronic acid is a oxidation product from glucose um, that actually is used in the human body as part of a detoxification pathway. Uh, so there's a wide range of different uh, uh, toxins that are being detoxified in the liver uh, using glucuronic acid as part of the chemical reaction, essentially. Um, so if you add glucuronic acid to your body, that should help that pathway. And there is some uh, laboratory studies and some uh, actual clinical studies showing that that is the case. Uh, now, not all kombucha bottles will contain glucuronic acid. And we don't actually know which species produce glucuronic acid. Um, but we now have actually a fairly large collection of kombucha isolates, so individual pure species that we've generated from kombucha. So we can figure this out, right? We can actually test which of our isolates are producing glucuronic acid. And if we have one that produces a lot more glucuronic acid than in others, uh, we can actually get a genome sequence out of that and figure out what enzymes and what metabolic pathways are are involved in uh, producing that. So that is uh, something that's fairly high on our list of priorities for something to follow up on as well. And we are actually currently doing some experiments, uh, growing some of our isolates, uh, and we have a assay in the lab to test the uh, glucuronic acid production. So I mentioned we have these isolates, right? So that is really sort of hardcore microbiology 101. Here's a beautiful poster that was generated by uh, one of our members, May, on um, this entire process. And it, it is quite a process to, uh, to get from essentially fermented tea, which has, you know, maybe dozens of different uh, microbial species in there, both bacteria and yeasts, to having a pure culture of one of the strains in that mixture, right? So that is our goal. Uh, so it starts out with just, you know, kombucha. And we've used both uh, some of the commercial bottles and we've used some of the homegrown kombucha bottles. We've actually done this whole process now three times already and we'll likely do it a couple of more times because it, I, I feel it's a really interesting experience. Um, and so you take a, a small sample of the, the original kombucha and then you dilute it down enough such that when you put a drop on a petri dish and spread it out, you can you can find individual cells essentially that have landed on the petri dish, right? So if you grow that petri dish for a while, each of those individual cells will grow into a little mound of identical copies, and that is called a colony. So if you've seen pictures of a petri dish with little spots on it, those are called those are colonies, right? Uh, and you want to dilute your original sample down to just the right level. If you don't dilute it down enough, everything's going to be way too jumbled together and you won't be able to pull out the individual strains. If you dilute it too far, you're going to be wasting a lot of space and you're not going to get much diversity, right? So here's a, here's a plate that's a little bit too dense. And you see there's different types of colonies on here, which is what you want. Uh, here's one that is too sparse. Um, and then here's one that we actually used for, uh, for colony picking. 
So you may notice there's obviously colonies of different sizes on here. There's also ones that have different shapes. Some of them are flatter, some of them are rounder. Some of them are very wet looking, some are look drier and, and sort of dusty almost. Uh, I don't know if you can see it on your screen. Some of them are whiter, some of them are more creamy looking. Uh, so the goal at this point is to pick uh, one representative colony of each of those different types of colonies and then streak that out again on a separate Petri dish, right? And you do that for each of these different classes of colonies. So, so from one starting Petri dish, you might up, wind up with say a dozen Petri dishes in the second round. Um, and the reason why you spread it out again is because these colonies, you might have gotten unlucky and that colony might've originated from two cells landing right on top of each other. So you're not 100% certain that this colony is actually what's called clonal. So they're all clones of each other. They could all be clones of two or three cells that are different. Right? So by taking that colony and spraying it out again, we're gonna be creating more colonies. And each time uh, you sort of have exponentially more likelihood that what you wind up with is going to be a pure culture. All right, so, so here we've, we've taken one of these colonies and just streaked it out onto a Petri dish. And then you'll take another one of these colonies and streak it out again and do a couple of rounds of that. All right now, these are not fast growing organisms like E. coli or, or Baker's yeast. Uh, so each round of this can easily take a week uh, and you have to do a couple of rounds, right? So it's a, it's a series of workshops essentially. Um, and then you learn how to characterize colonies based on their color and their shape characteristics and stuff like that. Uh, and then eventually the goal is to wind up with a pure culture. Um, and here's one where the colonies have sort of very interesting uh, sort of texture to them. Um, and then you can start, you know, this, we're almost 100% certain that this is a single, uh, a single strain out of one of many in that for original uh, kombucha culture. Um, and at that point, you can, uh, you know, take a small sample of this and put it in the minus 80 freezer for safekeeping and figure out what it is. At this point, we still don't know what these cultures are, right? Uh, which is actually a, a safety issue, right? You should normally not do this in a biosafety level one lab, which is what we are because you are isolating organisms where you don't know a priori what they are. So we've actually spent a significant amount of time sort of drawing up safeguards for us uh, to make sure that we can do this safely in a biosafety level one lab, sort of make it biosafety level one plus essentially. Uh, and one of the big safeguards is that we're only doing this with a starting, uh, starting product that is food safe. Right, so we're starting with a fermented food. And we can do this with yogurt, we can do this with cheeses, but it has to be something that uh, is safe to eat to begin with. Uh, we also storing all of our samples uh, in, uh, and here you see some of our, our members actually uh, doing the whole isolation process. This is where we made good use of our six foot wide uh, by safety cabinet here. Um, we're also storing uh, all of our samples in Ziploc bags. And, sorry, I'm getting there. So we're teaching people how to uh, keep proper lab notebooks. There we go. So th this is how we are storing the isolates uh, until they have been identified. So they are uh, kept separate from all other uh, organisms, They're, they have a separate spot in the fridge and, and in the incubator. Um, we keep them in a Ziploc bag. We only open them in the biosafety cabinet, etc. cetera. Um, and we only 
the first thing we have to do with these is actually identify them. So we are, we've imposed, you know, a limitation on ourselves that we're not allowed to do any other experiments with these organisms other than identifying them first, right? Um, so we have like a, a lengthy written out uh, biosafety guideline document for how we do all of this and then uh, how we keep things safe, essentially by layering more safeguards on top of each other. And we've actually uh, double checked this with some real biosafety officials, uh, American Society for Biosafety Officials, uh, and, and I've gotten their blessing on the way we're doing this. So we're trying to use this sort of as a model for how other community labs can uh, do similar microbiology 101 experiments. Uh, in a biosafety level one lab. Um, so the way we identify the isolates is based on sequencing a single gene that carries enough information that you can tell different species apart. Right, so that's uh, for bacteria, that's typically the 16S gene. Um, so I'm not going into detail here on the whole process uh, essentially, you break open the cells, you collect the DNA, you amplify just that one gene that you're interested in. Um, and then once you've done that amplification using PCR, uh, you do a gel actophoresis run to verify that you've actually amplified that 16S gene. Uh, and if you see a band on the gel, that means you've been successful and you can submit that sample to a sequencing company uh, to actually sequence that gene. Right. So you see some of our members here uh, sort of practicing by their pipetting to, uh, to load a, uh, a gel here. Uh, what you wind up with in the end is sort of a gel made out of agarose and you have these little depressions in their cold wells. That's where you load the material. And then you apply a voltage across this gel and the DNA will actually migrate through the gel uh, with a speed that is related to their, their size. Um, so smaller DNA fragments will migrate faster, larger DNA fragments will migrate slower. So all of the DNA that you loaded will spread out based on the size. Um, and then you can compare that with uh, a couple of pieces of DNA of known sizes to check if you've uh, amplified a piece of DNA that's just the right size of what you were targeting. Right. So this is in, uh, in normal light. Um, there's a fluorescent dye included in here that will make the, the DNA fluorescent under UV. So this is what it looks like under UV. And you see that there's like uh, a set of bands here that are nicely lined up with the exact right size uh, that we're targeting. Uh, so we're actually doing two batches of runs here. So we have a, uh, actually it's uh, upside down from the previous slide. So the wells are here and the, the DNA migrates downwards. Then we have a second set of, actually we have three set of sets of wells in, the, in this one. So you can load, uh, uh, eight samples there, another eight there, and another eight there if you want, and actually do three batches of, uh, on a single uh, gel actophoresis gel. Uh, and here's one, I'm not gonna go into all the details, but here's one that I annotated, uh, sort of explain what everything means. Uh, um, so in the end, for all of the ones where you see a band of the right size, you can submit those to uh, a DNA sequencing company. And uh, you know this is such a routine thing to do right now. Um, you can get uh, something like this sequenced for, I think GeneWiz is charging $8 now per sample. Uh, and you'll get your results back within like a day or two. Uh, we actually have a pickup service uh, or a pickup location at Counterculture Labs where GeneWiz or some other sequencing companies can come pick up our samples. Um, we just have to, you know, 
tell them to come pick it up. They'll send a courier and we get sequencing data back, uh, you know, in a couple of days. So this is a Sanger sequencing. So it will only give you fairly short amount of uh, sequence data, but it's long enough to cover the entire uh, 16S gene that we're interested in. So we're actually targeting the full length 16S to get uh, as much uh, coverage as possible. And we're doing that by sequencing the gene from both ends. Uh, so the gene is around 1500 bases. Uh, we get about a thousand bases typically from Sanger, but we're doing the first thousand bases and the last thousand bases, hopefully with overlap in the middle and we get the full length gene. So that's our process. And we currently have uh, 26 isolates in our minus 80 freezer. So here's uh, where they are stored and there are our precious isolates. So uh, we got all of those into the minus 80 freezer just before the, the pandemic hit. So they've patiently been waiting in the minus 80 freezer for us to revive them. Um, and the benefit of using a minus uh, a freezer at minus 80 degrees Celsius is that is that is long term storage, right? Everything is really stable at that extreme cold, uh, and you know these cultures could be sitting in there for years uh, and still be revivable after that. Uh, so you typically add uh, glycerol to make sure that your uh, bacterial culture doesn't crystallize. So you don't actually form ice crystals inside these tubes. Uh, so you don't break open the cells. That is a trick for uh, uh, keeping things alive in the minus 80 freezer. Um, so now that uh, you know our lab has reopened, uh, we're currently only open for members, uh, but we did restart our uh, experimental work for the Kombucha Genomics Project. Uh, and we have revived our, uh, our strains from the minus 80, starting with uh, the bacterial strains that are um, sort of the, the stereotypical kombucha strains, essentially. So these are Acetobacteraceae, so things like Comagatebacter and Gluconobacter and stuff like that. Um, and one of the... Um, the isolates that we have, we had already noticed before we put them in a minus 80, that it has this really odd behavior where it uh, produces a dark brown pigment, but only on one of the two bacterial growth media that we're using. Uh, so here's on uh, Yamanaka medium, which is a medium that's uh, uh, designed specifically for kombucha strains. So it's very high in sugar, but it doesn't have too much else. Um, and here you have MRS medium, which is actually designed for growing lactobacillus, since we know that, you know, commercial uh, growers especially add lactobacillus to their cultures. Uh, and you see that even on the Yamanaka medium, it's making very brown colonies. Um, but on the MRS medium, the entire medium turns brown, the entire plate turns brown. Uh, so what we think this is, is uh, melanin. Uh, melanin is typically a eukaryotic pigment. It's actually made in, you know, a wide range of different eukaryotes. You know, it's a thing that turns our skin brown. Uh, but if you ever had like black or, or brown mushrooms, that's typically melanin as well. So there's a wide range of eukaryotes that uh, produce melanin. Eukaryotic melanin is typically insoluble. And what we have clearly is soluble melanin um, because it's dissolved throughout the, uh, the Petri dish. It's in, it's in the agar, essentially, diffuses into the agar. Uh, this strain, based on our 16S analysis, was identified as a gluconobacter roseus. Um, but gluconobacter roseus is not supposed to make melanin. In fact, the only report we've been able to find of any gluconobacter uh, making melanin is a paper in Russian from 1981 that we're able to dig up. <laughs> uh, 
and the title translated says the, the, the melanin pigment of gluconobacter oxidants. So it's not the same gluconobacter, uh, but they're related species. And they, they go over uh, uh, some of the tests that they did to verify that this was melanin for, for their species. Uh, so no, we know what kind of spectrum to look for. And there's a couple of uh, uh, biochemical tests you can do. So with certain chemicals, the melanin is supposed to bleach. So there's we have a couple of tests we can do on this material. And yes, we, we have gotten uh, this, uh, this paper translated by a friendly volunteer. Um, there is no electronic version of this paper online, so we couldn't just use Google Translate. Uh, I guess you could scan it in and do Google Translate that way. Um, so um, melanin actually has a bunch of interesting biotechnology applications. Uh, there's a whole review paper that we found on the different uses of melanin uh, for commercial purposes. Um, so melanin is, so in our skin, it protects us from uh, ionizing radiation, right, from UV light. Uh, so it turns out melanin is really in, good at shuffling around electrons in interesting ways. Uh, so people have uh, made... Um, biological solar cells using melanin. People have made biological batteries using melanin. Uh, it has actually been uh, trialed as an anti-cancer compound. There's like a list of like a dozen different applications for melanin. Um, however, as I mentioned earlier, typically eukaryotic melanin is insoluble and we have an unusual soluble melanin uh, which might have some interesting uses. Uh, so we actually chose to use this uh, kombucha isolate as our first isolate to get a full genome sequence from. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm just gonna pretend that I left this slide blank because I want you to fill it in rather than I didn't get time to fill in the slide. But uh, we just got our first uh, uh, genome sequencing data back. Uh, raw Illumina sequencing data. Uh, we just got a, this in on Friday, so I've, I've only had a chance to tinker with it a little, tiny little bit. Um, and I'm proposing we're probably going to call this strain Gluconobacter rosea CCL1. Uh, this will likely not be the, the last uh, bacterial genome that we're going to be sequencing, so I'm open to uh, if somebody wants to pay for the naming rights to the next one. You know, it could be you know, Gluconobacter roseus Joe. Um, we have, uh, as I mentioned, we have 25 more isolates in our freezer right now, and I don't think we're going to sequence all of them, but uh, uh, we will likely sequence a couple of more. Um, this was surprisingly inexpensive. Right, so this is Illumina sequencing. Uh, a typical Illumina sequencing run starts at $500 for a run. So what you're doing is they are multiplexing multiple samples on a single uh, sequencing run. Um, we found a service from uh, the MIGS Center at the University of Pennsylvania that's only charging $80 uh, for 200 megabase of uh, raw Illumina sequencing data, which is plenty for a bacterial genome. Um, I actually wind up paying more for the overnight shipping with FedEx than I paid for the actual sequencing. So, um, that being said, you know, this is a completely volunteer run project. We don't have any funding from anywhere. So, uh, and any kind of uh, monetary contributions for the next sequencing run are gladly accepted. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm paying for this one out of my own pocket. Uh, but we would love to do a lot more uh, sequencing with these uh, samples as well. And uh, yeah, uh, we, we would love to get more people involved. And we would especially love to get uh, more people involved in, in the wet lab and sort of restart our whole uh, laboratory side of, of this project. 
Uh, during the pandemic, we spent a lot of time sort of doing literature reviews. We actually spent a couple of months just practicing on how you go from uh, raw genome data, raw se uh, Lumina sequencing data to an assembled genome and then how to annotate it and then how to do uh, metabolic modeling of the pathways that are in there. Uh, and we, we did that on, you know, publicly available uh, raw sequence data where we uh, there was a published paper. Uh, and we actually got good enough at it that we found some errors in the published genome. So uh, I think we're, we're well capable right now to uh, uh, do our own uh, genome assembly project and annotation project. So that's what we'll be uh, getting into next. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, uh, we do have bi-weekly meetups. The next one is next Tuesday. And you can find the whole uh, schedule on our calendar online. Uh, and yeah, if you're not already a CCL member, uh, become a member and join us in the lab. So. All right. Um, I tried to cover a couple of the questions on the, on the chat, uh, but feel free to ask questions uh, for anything that I haven't covered yet. Is there any engineering components to the lab itself, such as electrical records of mycelium? Um, yeah, definitely. We can definitely do that. Uh, we've we've sort of brainstormed before about trying to integrate some electronics in the growing SCOBY, for example. Um, we would love to be able to measure tensile strength of this SCOBY material. So that would mean setting up some kind of uh, pulling rig where we can, uh, with strain gauges, uh, so we can measure, uh, you know, what elongation we get at different amounts of force. So that's, that's an engineering project right there. Uh, there's a couple of other pieces of equipment like that that we would love to engineer that we currently don't have access to. I do know you can maybe work with the Crucible that's also in Oakland. They have mm -hmm. metal fabrication abilities. Yeah, we don't quite need the metal fabrication as much because, you know, that that part is fairly easy to DIY. Um, but, you know, making the entire piece of equipment where you have like a strain gauge and then some weights and then measuring elongation and stuff like that, it's, uh, you know. I, I think I have a good idea how to do it. I just don't have time to do it myself. Um, and that would allow us to do a lot more of the material science, interesting stuff. So. Um, I saw that you have a mammalian part, uh, mammalian cell side of the lab. Um, mm -hmm. If you weren't to be my mammalian, but rather reptilian or uh, would you call it a pescatarian? <laughs> fish shell. You can just say fish. <laughs> yeah. Would that also be allowable? Uh, in a yeah, definitely. Cell? Yeah. That actually would be uh, far safer than mammalian. So. I was like, oh, I can do this time. Let me so throw that out. Yeah. Only two people had replied, and I was only talking about one of them, but it was in a group chat. Is that weird? What? Is somebody I I, okay. All right. Some, somebody that isn't, isn't oh. muted at the moment. You're muted, right? Yeah, of course. Is it muted? No. <laughs> okay. Now they're muted. <laughs> yeah, so uh, the person that is currently setting up the uh, the culture room is uh, Ariana. And it's not 100% operational yet. We're still uh, sorting some things out. There were problems with the, uh, the incubator in there, but I think we found a replacement um and then she was uh she was uh out of action for a while uh but she's back and working on setting up that room so it's a sort of a separate little room off the the main lab um so we can enforce a, a higher degree of cleanliness in the in the culture room 
problem with uh, working with uh, mammalian or any kind of animal cells for that matter is you can't really do it in on the same equipment that is also used to uh, work with bacteria or yeast uh, because the, the infection level is just way too high. You have to do it in a in an environment that's a lot cleaner than the average molecular biology lab. So, uh, yeah, so our main requirement is we are a biosafety level one lab. So we cannot do all mammalian cultures. There are certain ones that uh, pose too much of a biosafety issue. Um, so human ones, there is a, a relatively small selection of human cell lines that we can work with. Uh, once you go away further from human, it gets easier, essentially. So rat cell lines, uh, insect lines, uh, you know, uh, reptilian, uh, squid, <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, you mentioned the, the, the new strain name. Is this the first strain that was isolated at CCL? This was not the first one isolated, okay. uh, but it'll be the first one sequenced. And that's, you know, there's a whole complicated process for how to get an official name in the scientific literature. Uh, but there's a, there's a back door now which is that you can just sequence an organism and give it a name and you don't have to jump through all the hoops that you used to have to jump through. Uh, so we can actually uh, publish a, uh, a genome paper on this newly sequenced organism and that will become a referenced paper and we can submit those sequences to the scientific databases and they will be referenced that way. It is much easier to uh, get a, a name for a new strain accepted than for a new species. So if we had something that was dramatically different from other known species, we might have to do uh, a bit more work to get a, a new name accepted. Uh, but strain naming strains is fairly easily done. That's fun. We have a question uh, in the chat about uh, opportunities for high schoolers. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so you can definitely join us uh, online. That's by far the easiest. Uh, and again, we're meeting every other Tuesday and we will be uh, doing a bunch of work on uh, analyzing this raw sequencing data and turning it into an assembled genome. Uh, so the way that sequencing is done these days, almost, well, the vast majority of the sequencing is done using a technology called Illumina. And Illumina can only sequence fairly short pieces of DNA. So what you need to do is if you want to sequence an entire genome, you first have to cut it up into small pieces. Then you sequence those small pieces, and then you have to put the entire jigsaw puzzle back together again. Right. Based on overlap between all these short reads, uh, you have to piece everything back together again into a full genome. So that process is called assembly. Uh, and there's, there's uh, you know, depending on how you do it, there's like half a dozen to a dozen different steps involved in just doing that assembly process. Um, and then once you have a full genome, you know, you just have a long piece of DNA, you still need to figure out what it does. So then you need to figure out where the genes are, what genes does it have, where are they, what do those genes do? Uh, so that process is called annotation, right? Uh, so, and so this is what we've been practicing for, you know, several sessions during the pandemic is we took some of the raw sequencing data that was available online and, and went through that whole process. So we we have a pretty good idea on how to do it now. And I think with our actual new genome that we have, it'll go much faster than, than what we were doing before where we were all sort of trying to learn it ourselves as we went along. Uh, so, yeah. Any you want to touch on in-person part of 
uh, high school. So, yeah, so to have people under 18 in our space, uh, we need to have a parent present at all times. So we definitely can have uh, uh, younger people in the lab. They need to be a member and at least one of their parents needs to be a member as well. Um, and then we have, you know, we vet you for, for safety and all of that. And yeah, you can actually be a member and work in the wet lab, uh, but there always has to be a parent present, which, you know, makes the logistics a little bit more difficult, but you know, there's, there's some people that are doing that. Um, Any other questions? Let's see. Let me look through uh, more of the chat here. Can we create melanin tattoos? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I bet if you would were to make a uh, uh, melanin extract, you can probably use it as an ink. It would be a soluble melanin, however, so it might actually dissolve into your skin rather than staying put. Uh, I don't know. Nobody's tried it before. So, <laughs> uh, one of our uh, members is actually looking into the the SCOBY material itself to see if it's a good material to practice tattooing on, because it is when you partially dry it out, it does feel a lot like skin essentially, and it sort of has an interesting give that's similar to skin. So it's a useful tattoo practice material. Oh, somebody asked about the tyrosine experiment. Um, so one of the experiments we're currently doing in the lab is uh, digging into the difference between these two growth medium. Why do we get melanin on one but not on the other? So the one on top here I mentioned is a t traditional medium for kombucha culture. So it has a lot of sugar, but not too much else. Whereas this MRS medium has a lot more like proteins and amino acids and stuff like that. Turns out that melanin is actually uh, produced in the body by polymerizing tyrosine. And tyrosine is one of the amino acids. So our current hypothesis is that the difference really is this medium has a lot of tyrosine, therefore can make a lot of melanin this medium has almost no amino acids and therefore has a limited amount of melanin that it can produce. Uh, so we are we currently have a little experiment running where we uh, we made liquid medium with the Yamanaka uh, supplemented with different amounts of tyrosine. And then we're growing this culture in that liquid medium in the hopes that uh, we'll see the, the cultures with more tyrosine should be making more uh, more melanin. If our hypothesis is correct, of course. We'll have to wait and see. I, I uh, checked on the results yesterday and it hadn't quite grown long enough yet. Um, yeah. Um, so that'll, that'll be interesting. There's a couple of other possibilities. One might be that on this medium, it's making insoluble uh, melanin, so it does not diffuse into the medium. Although these colonies definitely look a lot blacker than, than these do. Uh, so I think there is more melanin being produced as well. The other possibility is that um, the colonies may actually be secreting the enzyme to produce melanin into the medium. Um, and, and maybe it does not secrete that enzyme on this medium, right? So there's, there's ways you can test whether, uh, what you're seeing here is a small molecule like, uh, melanin being diffused into the medium or whether it's due to an actual enzyme diffusing into the medium. Uh, for example, you can grow these, uh, these bacteria in a liquid medium, get rid of the cells and collect just the spent medium that may have the enzyme in it, 
and then add tyrosine and see if suddenly without the cells present, if you start seeing melanin being produced. So there's a couple of interesting uh, tests we can do to check different hypotheses for how the melanin is being produced. First though is verifying that it is actually melanin. And for that, uh, you know, we just need to take a liquid culture and do some biochemical tests and look at its spectrum under UV spec and it's a couple of different things we need to work on in the wet lab. Any other questions? Otherwise, that will be it for today. How did I do on time? Thanks for the update, Patrick. Patrick. Very cool. Thank you. And I, I hope to see some of you next Tuesday. Uh, Tuesday is 7 o'clock. And yeah, we will be digging into our new genome sequence and figure out what it all means. Awesome. Thanks, Patrick. Yeah.